good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome to this speaker series on negotiating with state and non-state military counterparts. This is the first event of this speaker series that we will have on a bi-weekly basis until the end of the year. My name is Verela Erni. I am the head of operations at the Center of Competence and Military Negotiation. I understand that some of the participants with us today are the first time at an event of the CCHN. So just as a very brief introduction, the CCHN is a strategic partnership between ICRC, WFP, UNHCR, and Doctor Without Borders. And our core mandate is to build a global community of practice of humanitarian frontline negotiators. I'm very, very excited to be here today with uh, Stephen Kilpatrick, who will be the first speaker in our series. Um, Stephen works at the ICRC as a thematic advisor at the Unit on Relations with Arms Carriers. Um, Stephen has a very interesting background for this. He's actually a former officer in the British Army, and he will really be able to bring us the perspective of the counterpart, which is the objective of this whole speaker series to bring us the perspective of our counterparts, how they perceive us to help us negotiate better with them. So Stephen will be presenting. Um, I would like to ask you to hold your questions until the end, but feel free to write them in the chat. I will be taking notes and then we'll have a question answer and discussion after the presentations. I would also like to draw your attention to the fact that this session is being recorded, only the presentation part. The moment we go into questions, answers, and discussion, we will switch off the recording and check on how those apply. So I will um, leave it to you, Stephen, and I hope you will enjoy the session. Well, thank you very much indeed, Fiorella, and uh, good afternoon to, to everybody, and thank you for, for taking the time to, uh, to come and listen. Um, just to amplify what Fiorella said about the CCHN, I've spent four years um, working with them, and um, it, it has cons improved considerably in my negotiation skills. All a bit late, I sense, but, um, but hugely valuable nonetheless. Now, why, uh, why have, am I standing in front of you today? Um, it's partly because every day, every morning, I jump on the bus and I come to, to the ICRC headquarters here in Geneva, and sitting alongside me are people with all sorts of uh, lanyards and badges from different humanitarian organizations. And I often reflect uh, that a lot of their work uh, relates to the conduct uh, of arms carriers, whether they be state armed forces, non-state armed groups, uh, state police forces, private military security companies. And I often wonder how much they know about the um, the organizations that influence their lives. And so uh, I've decided to, to, uh, to come along and present to you today. I should caveat what I say by saying whilst I work for the ICRC, I don't speak as a representative of the ICRC, but I very much hope that I won't say anything to contradict what the ICRC would say. I speak as a, an ex-British military officer, but I very much hope that I'm going to try and make it uh, reflect militaries worldwide, and I'll explain why I think that. Um, and it's based very much on my own uh, experience and, and perspectives. Now, we did, did uh, promote this as, as being uh, reflective of, of uh, non-state armed groups as well, but my colleague Reuben Stewart will be with you on the 21st of November to do better justice to the whole notion of, of uh, non-state armed groups. So I'm going to concentrate on the age of engagement with state armed forces, with a little touch on uh, non-state armed groups here and there. My first challenge is, uh, is to move the thing along. Let me see if I can do it from here. No. Bit of a hitch. Just, uh, just bear with me a second, whilst my technical colleague um, helps me out. Again. There we go. And oh, forgive me, you're you're looking at an infantryman, so um, even the clicker presents challenges. I could have called this when two tribes go to war, um, 
And that might have been quite relevant. But when Frankie Goes to Hollywood uh, re released this song, he was more thinking of the tribes in conflict. My sense is that the tribes, the military humanitarian organizations, work alongside each other in, in conflict. And for example, the ICRC, as we remind a lot of people quite regularly, was born on the battlefield, the battlefield of Solferino. And wherever there is conflict, you will see the ICRC and many other humanitarian organizations. I will talk about occasions when the military and humanitarian organizations are in conflict, and certainly one big one in my experience, and I'll touch on that. But I do believe that there is often a clash of cultures. Um, and we're going to talk about whether there is a military culture. I think there are characteristics that militaries all share. And I also believe that there is a humanitarian culture. So we do occasionally have a clash of cultures. This is my day job. Um, for the last seven years, I've been working for the ICRC uh, in the Unit for Relations with Arms Carriers. And, and I began in Myanmar for three years, and I've come to the headquarters for, for the last four. And our role is to uh, encourage um, state armed forces, arms carriers, to understand uh, international humanitarian law, or more broadly, the laws that govern their, govern their military operations, and to be able to apply them. And therefore, we engage with audiences uh, all over the place. And you'll see there one of my, my handbooks, uh, I say mine, I produced it with a, a group of other people, that encourages commanders to better understand how to reduce civilian harm during their urban operations. Um, more, and that one uh, was released two years ago, and it's been, been translated into, into 12 languages. Uh, and, uh, and John Grisham is quite worried about, uh, about his sales these days. More recently, uh, this is a, a handbook we, we released two months ago, and this focuses on the employment of military forces when they are conducting law enforcement operations. And those of you in the field, in headquarters, will know that military organizations are quite often employed to augment or to replace the police force. And we see examples of this worldwide, and we saw it particularly in COVID. And this handbook highlights the law because the law is considerably, significantly different. And of course, the principles of those operations are significantly different. And of course, the challenge is not to write these handbooks, but to get people to open them, to read them, and then to apply them. And that's really part of my role. So in the last seven years with the ICRC, an absolute privilege to be working for such an organization. But it wasn't always this way. And I'm going to show you a career in three in four photos. And I wonder what photos you would choose for your own careers. Well, these are mine. 1984, uh, my first tour of Northern Ireland. Um, and uh, I should explain, and I, 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 I always try and encourage my humanitarian colleagues to understand the military organization. This is a platoon, um, 30 men or, or now men and women. Um, and they are commanded by an officer, and I sitting there looking rather chubby and with considerably more hair, um, was the platoon commander. And under my command, I had 30 young men. I was assisted by a platoon sergeant, three corporals and three lance corporals. And that's the platoon hierarchy. And our role was to support the, uh, the, the local police force in what, in what we knew as, as combating terror. And I did uh, my first tour in 84 and then three subsequent tours um, as a, uh, a platoon and then a company commander. And that's the next level of command. The company is three times as big as a platoon. So about a hundred young men and women uh, commanded by someone uh, um, uh, of the rank of major. And so already we're talking about officers, commissioned officers, lieutenant, captain, major, and they are supported by non-commissioned officers, um, corporals, sergeants, warrant officers. Um, and so that's an important difference. And we're going to come shortly to talk about that with the whole the rank hierarchy. I should just emphasize that militaries put a great store by training. 
before I uh, arrived with this this platoon, I probably I've been six months to Santa, so I'm an officer training school. Now they do twelve months because I think they're, 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 the training is more involved. And then I've been for three months to to uh, our platoon commander's battle school uh, to prepare them. So nine months before I even set foot in the platoon. So young soldiers there. They're, the youngest will be 18, um, and they will all have gone through about an, uh, an 11 week training uh, to be soldiers, and then another 10 weeks or so to be um, uh, to be infantry soldiers. And the same is true of many militaries, most militaries around the world, that they they put a lot of emphasis on training, and therefore what you see is actually quite well prepared for what they are required to do. And we'll talk about what they're required to do. So the 1980s and a bit of the 1990s were spent uh, in Northern Ireland, going to and from Germany or from the UK. But the 90s themselves were in the Balkans for me. I did, I did two tours, one in, in uh, Bosnia, and this one more, more recently in 2000, as what was known as a battalion commander uh, in Kosovo. Uh, and what you see there is, is my armoured battle group. Um, well, not all of them. Uh, we had 56 armoured vehicles. The one in front is a warrior armoured vehicle. In fact, it's my own one. Uh, that has a crew of three and, and seven uh, young men in the back who are required when the, uh, the battle starts to get out of the vehicle and fight with the enemy close up. And at the back, you'll see uh, a, a Challenger tank. And all of these were under my command. Uh, and our role was to deter Milosevic from returning uh, to Kosovo. And if he decided to uh, ignore our, our messages, then we were to defeat him. And so that's an armed uh, uh, battle group. And that was my role in, in, uh, in 2000. So we've gone from platoon company up to battalion. A battalion is about 850 men and women. Um, and uh, probably that was, was the uh, the high watermark of my career, if I'm honest. The 2000s um, were spent largely in Africa. I had the good fortune to spend two years in, in, uh, in Kenya, where I commanded a small team of about 15 young men and women, whose role was to support the training of African um, contingents, battalions, who were deploying uh, on peacekeeping missions. And I went back and forth to Darfur, to Burundi, uh, to Sudan. I also found myself at one stage in, uh, in Beijing, training the, uh, the PLA to send a, uh, a company to, uh, to Khartoum. Um, and we also trained the first Ugandan brigade to deploy to Somalia. Um, and that was a particularly rewarding job, as you can imagine. More challenging was this one. Uh, this was in 2012, 2013, when I was with the UN mission in South Sudan. And my, my job was about a chief of staff of the military headquarters. Effectively, I was third in command. Um, and this has always been probably my most challenging role. Uh, and all, it was all about negotiation, which is quite surprising when you have a chain of command and it's all about negotiation. But, we had a force of about 7,000 troops in those days. I suspect it's increased considerably since then. And you can see quite a lot from this photo. Each of us wears our national flag on our left shoulder and our, our UN badge on our right shoulder. You can barely see mine because I think for some reason the Brits wanted to keep our flag as small as possible for some reason or another. And my job was to get the trains running on time. Um, and it involved quite a lot of encouragement, um, negotiation, if you like, because I sensed conflicts between the national flag and the UN badge, and conflicts between the, the uh, civilian component of the UN mission and the military component. And the, the civilian component asked us effectively to do our job, and that's what I tried to get us to do, to, to patrol at night, to deploy for long patrols in order to go to places where people didn't feel reassured unless they saw the UN um, badge. Um, and for us as a military headquarters to combine with the joint headquarters, so it was a truly joint headquarters. Um, and I struggled, if I'm honest. 
Um, although I had a rank above most of these folk here, um, the, the national um, flag was quite prominent and I, I felt I, I fought quite a few battles, but many of the negotiations. I should just mention my, my military assistant, Roj, who's got his back to us. In that pack, he's got a lot of chocolate um, just to keep us going. But the relationship between a commander and his or her military assistant is quite profound. And I think it pays people to understand that if you are negotiating with a senior officer, the importance of treating the junior staff well. Because Rog was the gatekeeper. Rog was from, from Nepal and he was a major, so comparatively junior. But he was the gatekeeper to everybody that uh, wanted to, to come to me. And I would just urge you to put down on your pad to, to treat the, 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 uh, the little people well. And I use little people in this, it's, uh, it's now in a sense. So that's, um, that's the challenge of, of uh, UN missions. And people have written a lot about UN missions and the particular challenges that come with them. And this one was no different. And um, I'm not sure what the solutions are, but maybe we will touch on that in question. And the final uh, part of the, the, uh, the decade beyond 2010, um, was spent in the Middle East. Uh, I did a tour in Iran in 2003 um, as the go-between between between the coalition in Iraq and the Islamic Republican Guard Corps. I spent time in Basra in 2007 in the headquarters. And, and finally, uh, I was the director of studies uh, at the Q8 Military Star College. And this is partly the reason why I say that although I'm talking specifically about the British military, it applies to many militaries, are that, is that there are many uh, staff colleges around the world, of which the, the UK, the US, the French, the, the, the Q80, and several in Africa, where they train officers internationally. And so the messages, the doctrine, the policy, the values permeate. And so you will see uh, a lot of um, a lot of uh, information being shared and a lot of experiences being shared. And this is important when you are negotiating with a senior military officer, because as he or she will probably have been to a college overseas, and you might have some sort of link with that college or the the uh, the, the, the city where it is. For example, in Paris. Um, and uh, there may be some sort of link. And when, we'll talk a little bit about building bridges, uh, which are important. I'll just touch on some of the bling. I, I, I put that in the title. On my left shoulder, you'll see the, the, uh, the tiger badge, and you'll see it also on my armored vehicle uh, front right mud flap. The tiger was awarded to my regiment uh, for 20 years unbroken service in India, many moons ago. And um, uh, my point is, I think, that you can tell uh, quite a lot about military officers and soldiers by the badges they wear. And just refer, just noticing the guy in the background there with his, his uh, uh, sunglasses on, he's wearing his medals. Now, in, in, in my military, we don't wear medals in, in the, the, the uniform that he um, he's wearing, but often you'd see militaries wearing their medals in combat uniform, and you can work out where they've been. And if this particular officer has been in the UN, then you'll see a particular medal there. And that gives you another touch point that maybe you or one of your staff has served in, in South Sudan, Central African Republic, um, in Somalia, for example, and there's a, a small bridge, albeit a broke bridge, that you can build. So there it is, the, the, uh, the career and four, four photos, which prepared me for, for my role in, in the ICRC. And I hope that I can share some of the, uh, the ideas here. So th this is the, uh, the progress. We're going to talk about uh, the central ideas. There are now two. We're going to talk about force. We're going to touch on security. We can talk about decisions. And I'm going to introduce you to the OODA loop, unless you've already encountered it. I'm going to talk about the place, needs, we're going to talk about coins, badges, and bling. I'm going to make some suggestions at the end, and I'm going to, in true military fashion, end on a high. Central idea that both arms carriers and humanitarians believe they understand each other. And that's quite dangerous, because I'm very confident 
that they simply don't. And there is there are preconceptions that I see in the humanitarian world and the military world that just don't stack up. Uh, and that's why, arguably, this program that the CCHA has, has put together is important. And secondly, both organizations are fiercely principled and they believe exactly what they do and its righteousness. And that's very important. So what from this? Um, it's so, so important when you're engaging with a military officer to make him or her understand where you're coming from, what your organization represents, what the principles are, because very often officers in conflict will see many humanitarian organizations and they start to coalesce and that's dangerous. So if you want to stand out, spend time on the political level of, of negotiation, explain in two minutes the elevator pitch, what your organization does, what its principles are and what you're after. And that's really important. And also make proper introductions because, in my experience, people aren't terribly good at that. But what are the principles? Now, you know the humanitarian principles, and of course, the ICRC adds uh, voluntary service, uh, universality, and unity to those four, but those are the core humanitarian principles. But militaries have core values, and this is important when you put together a bunch of really disparate folk and you ask them to be prepared to fight for each other and indeed to, to give their life for each other. And we know, certainly in the British military, we used to know it by the mnemonic solid C. And this stands for selfless commitment, the preparedness to lay down your life, to respect others. This means the people that you're dealing with, arguably the civilians, other humanitarian organizations, but of course, your fellow soldiers, loyalty to the organization, but probably more so to the fellow soldiers. Integrity means effectively that you can trust people. Discipline is always a, a, a key tenet of, um, of, of military organizations, both discipline itself, but also self-discipline, the fact that people can self-motivate themselves and they can be relied upon to do things, uh, even if they're in very unpleasant conditions at two o'clock in the morning when it's dark and it's very, very wet. And, and they would ask for courage, physical courage, of course, because they have to be prepared to fight, but moral courage is terribly, terribly important. And particularly in an organization where progression is very important. As a, as a battalion commander, I had five company commanders, all of whom thought they were very, very good. Indeed, they were better than each other. And it takes a certain amount of moral courage to say, tell them, actually, you're not quite as good as you think you are, and you're never going to be a battalion commander. Now, that's a, that's a very, perhaps a weak example. But at every stage, one, one needs to exhibit moral courage in telling people some unpleasant detail. But there's often a attention I find, and this, it almost always boils down, in my view, to these two principles of the law of armed conflict. On the one hand, humanitarian organizations from, uh, see humanity at the, as the absolute pivotal um, principle, whereas militaries, for militaries, it's all about the mission, the achievement of the mission and the gaining military advantage. And therefore, there is a clash, there is friction, there are tensions, and it's partly the role of organizations like mine to, to try to get both sides to understand how those tensions can be overcome and how humanity can be achieved whilst accepting that the military uh, mission is paramount. And that requires a lot of, a lot of dialogue. Force is a key tenant, tenet of militaries worldwide. They talk of force project projection, combat power, offensive spirit. And I put FFS because it doesn't mean what you think it does. And I'm just trying to think of what it does mean. Um, find, fix, and strike. 
was the something we all learned at the start of college. You find your enemy, you fix them in position, and then you strike them. And that's re that just reflects the fact that militaries are all about dominance, overcoming an adversary. Even if they are the soldiers are in logistics, they're chefs, they're communicators, they're all about supporting the effort that dominates and overcomes. And this can very often translate into the attitude and the approach of an officer to his or her negotiation with you. They will be sat across the table, they will be standing in the, in the, uh, the clearing, and they will expect to gain the upper hand in negotiation. What's interesting is that militaries don't often, and certainly in the case of mine, when I was a soldier, don't have doctrine for negotiation. And this was exposed in, in, in 2007 uh, in, in uh, the Middle East, where big negotiations took place and everybody said, well, how are we doing this? Why are we doing it? On what basis are we doing this? My message is that if you have doctrine for negotiation, if you follow the, the tools promoted by the, the CCHN, then arguably you're at a, an advantage and can start to, to, to claw back some of this ground that is lost to this dominance on the other side of the table, in my view. Security is so very important. And in this photo, you see one of my officers in Kosovo. You also see um, uh, uh, Bernard Kushner, who was one of the founder members of uh, MSF. You can tell that this officer is a, a second lieutenant. He's very junior because he's got one star on his chest there. Uh, and of course, he's got the tiger on his left shoulder, shoulder. Security is a principle of war. There are 10 and security is right up there amongst the, the, the most important. And all other activities have to uh, use that as a baseline, whether it be security of personnel, security of weapons and ammunition, security of vehicles, security of bases, security of logistics. It's all about security. And without security, nothing else can happen. In my experience, military commanders often use security as their trump card in negotiation. They will never want uh, to, uh, for a humanitarian organization to, to, to uh, to be exposed in their area of operations or at risk or worse. And therefore they can, will quite often say, even if they don't want you to, to, uh, to, to make that journey, to visit that, that particular refugee camp, for example, I can't guarantee your security. And I've used it myself in the CCHN. We have exercises and we play the role of General Wallace or General Clivus. And my first card is security. I simply can't take it. it uh, that protect you when you're moving through my area, therefore you can't go. My message is, and this is not an easy um, battle to, to win, one must acknowledge the concerns of the military, but prepare a counter argument. What is it about your organization that makes it so important that you need to go to that particular uh, venue? What is it about, about your organization that needs to be seen by the local population and the non state armed group? And therefore, your security is actually bound by the fact that you do make this journey. Really, really important. It's not an easy win, but, but prepare for that because I think the general, every time, will, will, will raise the, the issue of security. I thought it, I'd interest, uh, uh, introduce you to the OODA loop. Now, my, my um, sample of three people here in the CCHN indicated that they didn't know what the OODA loop is. And to military folk, the OODA loop is, is all pervading. We learned this at Staff College and, um, and uh, we regu regularly used to, to use it. It was in, invented by a soldier, Colonel John Boyd. He was an airman in the, the Korean War and he was flying. Um, and in his aircraft, there was a large canopy through which he was able to see better than his adversary. He realized that he could observe better. He could work out where he was and where his enemy was. He can then decide faster and then he could act. And militaries use this all over, uh, over the world. The, the fact that the, the ability to observe, orient, decide, and act faster than your enemy means that you will probably be acting when they're still orienting or deciding. And dare I say, we've had a good example of that over the last few days. So it was created by soldiers, be used by soldiers, adapted 
for business. And, and if you go on to, to um, uh, Google and you put in the OODA loop, the first thing that comes up is not, has nothing to do with military OODA loops. It's all about uh, for business. Now, this is partly why military like, militaries like to move at pace. They use the term tempo, which means moving at, spe at speed, moving with force, and being decisive. And it, it underpins acts such as dynamic target, targeting, which, of course, very often causes a lot of civilian harm. And so this dialogue about, about the Udaloop and tempo is often something that we can cross over. But I'll come back to this in a while because I believe that it's possible for humanitarians to get into the military decision cycle by good preparation and so slightly unhinge that general who's feeling so confident across the table. And by the general, I don't say that you're always negotiating with generals. You may be uh, negotiating with, with colonels or even captains, but that senior officer across the table. And I'll talk shortly about why it is important to negotiate with people of rank. Indeed, let's talk about it now. Everyone has their place in the military. And indeed, when, when you join a humanitarian organization, you need to understand where everybody fits in. And it's unfortunate because nobody in the humanitarian organization wear rank. Um, whereas in militaries, everybody fits in. You know what they've done, where they've been, what authority they have, and therefore the ability to make decisions. And this is something that I produced for my team in Myanmar, and we put it up, well, I, I wanted them to put it above their sun visor, so that whenever they approached a checkpoint or they were going to, to a dialogue with, a, with a, a, a military group, they would know roughly who they were talking to. In simple terms, uh, Non-commissioned officers wear their, their uh, rank on their shoulders, on their, their arms, normally their right arms, and occasionally if they're quite senior non-commissioned officers on their wrists. And officers, commissioned officers, those with rather more authority on their shoulders or on their chests. And I suppose a rule of thumb is the more stuff they've got on the, the badge, the more authority they have. And you can see that this being so. And I do urge you, if you have anything to do with, with armed forces, to become familiar with this, because it will allow you to know whom you're talking to, but it'll allow you to know that you're speaking to the right level of command and not talking to a corporal when you thought you were talking to a captain or a colonel, but also you can call them by their rank, which actually will go down very well. And it will impress them that, that you've done your homework. So um, as you go up to the checkpoint, quick glance at the, uh, at the list and say, oh, there's a corporal. Good morning, corporal. Uh, we just need to, to pass through your checkpoint. And of course, as he says no, well, then you can say, well, can I speak to, a, to an officer, maybe a captain? And we move on. Um, but that's very, very important. And it was noticeable um, when I first uh, became a humanitarian that, that, that this wasn't always so. I showed this photo because I was struck the first time I showed it by the reaction that I've got. And people very often found this uh, to be quite threatening, um, a sense of foreboding that this, this young man presents. Um, and I would argue the opposite, actually, and I would be much more confident of negotiating with him at a checkpoint than talking to this fellow in, in his... In his uh, Garb carrying his AK-47. The reason I like this, this fellow is that he's he looks professional, and I'm confident that I can get a sensible response. It might be not, not the response that I want, but he's got his helmet on and he's got his helmet strapped fastened. And that means if he's going to run, a, run around, his helmet's not going to fall. fall. His uniform is, is smart, he's wearing clear badges of rank, and this is something that we always like to see that people can be accountable for their actions or their actions of the subordinate because they are displaying the badges of work. He's got his, what we call his first field dressing, this little, little bandage on his uh, equipment. So if something goes badly wrong very quickly, he can apply it. Uh, apply. Uh, he's got his map in, in, down his, in his, uh, his pocket in the front, although I think that should be for his body armor plate, so I'm not sure that that's the correct thing. 
and he's put on camouflage cream and he's put it on a, in a way that he's taken time over it and just hasn't smeared it smear across his face. And he has a badge that indicates the unit that he's from, which, which tells me quite a lot. So that young fellow looks to me professional. On the flip side, if you go to a checkpoint and you can't see any badges of rank, you see weapons very clearly, but you can't work out who's in, who, who, in command, then uh, that presents a challenge. So I would much prefer my soldiers to, to dress like that. And I, my experience of encountering folk um, on my right, your left, um, is that that, uh, that presents challenges. We'll talk about needs as well. And this is where we're, we're, we're closing in on, on uh, the negotiation itself and preparing for the negotiation. And this is how I get inside the military decision cycle. Because very often you prepare to go to your negotiation and you think, okay, I'm going to take the, I'm going to take the boss, I'm going to take the deputy and maybe you know, the deputy's advisor uh, and that's it. But let's think a little bit more carefully about who we might include. And I'll tell you this, this little, little story, if I may. And this is Guido, the fellow in the glasses, and he'd be horrified that I'd be putting on, up on, on a presentation here. Um, and he, is, he was the prosthetic um, delegate for our, our delegation. And he uh, was an expert in making uh, limbs, prosthetic limbs for folk who had been injured, often by landmines, but also by, you know, by other injuries. And um, he, he oozes expertise. He knows his stuff. Um, but in, in negotiation terms, he's quite low in the, in the, um, in the pecking order. But I worked out that militaries like um, the one that we were engaging with in, in, in Southeast Asia um, had suffered uh, a lot of landmine casualties and they had their own prosthetic organization but it wasn't particularly good so i said to Gino, let's let you come along with us and we'll tell them that we're bringing our prosthetic guys so they can have their prosthetic guys and and we can explain to the general what you do and how we can help him to benefit those soldiers who've been so badly injured and we went through the whole business of the, the normal negotiations and we said, General, I'd like to introduce Guido, we'd like to talk to you about prosthetics. And the whole room stopped and everybody listened. And Guido put his boot, his uh, prosthetic feet on the table and it just made the message very clear. And at the end of the negotiation, admittedly, we didn't get all that we sought, but we probably made greater advantages than had Guido not been with us. The general walked around the table, I put out my hand to shake his hand, and he walked straight past me, and he shook Guido's hand. That spoke volumes. And that's why I think it's always important to work out who, who is on your negotiation team, and don't just assemble it based on their seniority. Medical training is also very important, and no doubt Ruben will touch this on this when he talks about non-state armed groups. A lot of militaries like the medical training that, that, uh, that we can provide. And maybe in your organization, there are other skills, engineering skills, that don't add to the military capacity, but better prepare them to reduce civilian harm, such as medical, such as prosthetics, maybe for, to identify uh, engineering works. Where is the critical infrastructure uh, in, a, in a, uh, an urban area that they're about to attend? So my, my message is, think about the composition. The agile implying the typology of negotiation. When we were stuck at the political level, then we went right down to the technical level and played the Guido card. I just show this very briefly, if I may. I, I tried to create a typology of armed force attitude towards humanitarian organizations. And I, I did a bit of research in, in across the road in the ICRC and asked my colleagues whether they, they uh, knew of anything. And I came up with this, um, and it introduces two different relationships uh, within militaries. We know one as mission command and the other as directive control. Mission command gives a lot of authority to subordinates. So a major is told, take that bridge, 
just uh, sees that, that hill, but he's not told how to do it. And he or, or she is allowed simply to get on with it. And that gives them great flexibility and allows that OODA loop to, to move a lot faster. Those that are directive controlled are in many respects the opposite. They rely on the general to tell the colonel what the major needs to do. And then the major does what the general told him or her. Um, and that slows everything up. Um, and I've got four different um, military forces there, and I caveat it by, by saying that there are variations across a force and according to rank and experience. But I reckon there are four different types. And curiously, I, I was struck by this handbook that the ICRC has produced, um, which, which is a, a, um, uh, a handbook on uh, engaging with state armed forces to prevent sexual violence. And we'll give you the link in the chat at the end. And this also has a typology of, of, um, uh, of engaging with armed forces based on their response to, to uh, sexual violence. And it's not far different. So I feel quite pleased about this. But, but these high-end mission commanded militaries, we meet quite often. And their attitude to, to, to humanitarian organisations is generally quite dismissive and they're quite indifferent. And in that respect, one has to be professional, always, you can see this as, as a common theme, and demonstrating utility. And that in part goes back to, to the, the typology of negotiations that I'm talking. Then I identified youthful militaries, but those who are not modernizing and they are heavily directed controlled. So if you go to the checkpoint, you see a sergeant or a young officer and none of them can make the decision. They have to go to the captain. The captain can't make the decision, has to go to the colonel. And eventually it goes up to the general and everything goes very, very slowly. And we see this quite regularly when we're inviting people to workshops. We hope that somebody at some stage will like to uh, will make a decision. Then there are these centrally directed control. These are these older military forces state armed forces where they just i'm sorry i should mention that the, the youthful ones are tend to be suspicious and cautious of humanitarian organizations because they really don't understand them uh, and they haven't sent people on on un missions so they have no real experience of centrally directed control are rejectionists they keep keep uh, humanitarian organizations at arm's length unless their legal obligation say that they have to, to engage with them. And this is a question of gradual relationship building over, over months and years. And the, the, the final one is the youthful and modernizing. And these are ones, and, and, and uh, we see examples around the world, where they are very accommodative. They're collaborative with humanitarian organizations. They see the benefits, both in terms of, of, of uh, their development, but also in, in PR terms. And one, one will try and be professional and supportive. It's, it's a first attempt. I'm sure this can be refined, but I was curious that, that it, it reflected roughly what it was said in the handbook. And if you have a better idea here, then please um, put it in the chat and we'll um, ignore it. Now, how does one adapt the OODA loop um, to, to get inside the military uh, decision action cycle to slightly destabilize the general, the colonel, across the, the table from you um, or, or in the, the clearing. And I've talked about some of the things, you know, you, you introduce yourself, you make sure that they fully understand, you might, and, and you work out who your, um, the composition of your negotiation team is. But I come up with my own four words. And this is, I don't throw these down for the sake of it, because these are really, really important. You need to prepare, because the, I don't think that militaries prepare for negotiation in the way that they should. And if you prepare yourself and do so in a way that is quite clear that you've prepared yourself, then you're in, on, on good ground. You do your research. Where is the general from? What staff college did he go to? What UN missions has he been on? What experience have we got in, uh, of him in, in, in the past? Tell, talk to us about your, his staff. Have we engaged with his military assistant before? What's his response to us or her response to us? 
and you start to build the picture, in order that you can work out your strategy, and of course the tools of distance nature and design are, are, are absolutely relevant here, and we'll talk about one of them in a second. But then, and this is my, my personal um, preference, you rehearse it. And we have a, used to have a saying in the military, time spent on rehearsal is never wasted. And I can often tell where people have re rehearsed their most negotiation in our exercises, because they go so much, much easier. And when you rehearse, you work out where the mistakes might be made, you come up with some good ideas, and by the time you've done that, you're ready to conduct. And then, of course, it goes as a loop. You can conduct your after-action review, and you prepare for the next one. And I think this is really important. The research and the rehearsal are pivotal. And we talk about the, the tools that the, the, the CCIHN uh, encourages, and this is central. The actor mapping, who are the influencers on uh, this particular individual? And, um, you know, on the face of it, you can you know very little about a person, but once you engage your, your national staff, once you do a bit of uh, research, um, I'm sure that you can start to build a picture and it will always impress a general if you know something about him or her before you go, when you go through the door. So this is really, really important. Engaging with the, the, uh, the peer organisations, working out who the local actors are and who those, those spoilers are. But I, I, I put great store by this. So we're getting towards the end here. And I just want to round it off with, with um, some reference to coins, badges and bling. And yes, of course, this is slightly tenuous. But how to build that bridge? You've got a rope bridge, you, you put some, some wood down, and now we're really starting to build a bridge to, to the negotiator. I want to talk about coins. A couple of weeks ago, I was in a, um, a workshop, and there was a couple of tense exchanges with, a, with a, a military officer. Of course, he was absolutely right, but we were talking about explosive weapons in populated areas. And at the end of the event, he came across to me, and he shook my hand, and in his hand was a coin. And this military have been exchanging coins for decades now. And they put a lot of store by this, uh, the, the, uh, the passing over of, of a coin, because it's, it reflects a bit of faith, a bit of a, a sense that you've got something in common, you've seen eye to eye, or you appreciate the person's approach. And I think in spite of our differences, I think we, we, uh, we, we can see each other's point of view. What's quite helpful is it's not a complete circle and it has a bottle open on it. But a lot of officers like these, and you can often go into to military offices and see um, trays of, 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 uh, of coins. Um, very often they've made stands, they can, they can be displayed um, uh, more visually. This is the, uh, the coin collection of my boss uh, in the ICRC, who, like me, is, uh, is ex-military. And my proof is that, that we put a lot of store my, my wife sadly calls this landfill, which I think is very uncharitable. But wouldn't it be great if humanitarian organisations had something similar? Well, funny old thing, the ICRC does. But we're very reluctant to use this um, to, to shake the hand and pass over the coin of the ICRC. Uh, and if your, your, your organisation has something similar, just something that can be passed over and makes the general think, oh, that's, that's quite something. I like that. Um, it might just get you that elevation that other humanitarian organizations, other people who beat a path to his or her door, don't. Um, badges, very, very important. And these tell you where organizations come from in the country, whether they're local, whether they've been flown in, short notice, whether they're a quick reaction force. And it can give you an idea of what's about to happen if, if, uh, if some of the, uh, the airborne uh, fire brigades suddenly arrive. So it's important to have to understand um, understand badges. And this isn't spying, this is this is available on Wikipedia and it goes above the, the, the sun visor. And finally, medals. The most important medal here from the humanitarian point of view is the blue one, the fourth from the right, um, with the two on it, because that's a UN medal. When folk, when the general has been to a to a, a, a UN operation, he or she will better understand humanitarians 
And it also gives you a hook on which to hang your, your engagement. General, I, I, I understand that you were in, in, in South Sudan. Um, you know, just explain to me, Ron, maybe you met, uh, maybe, maybe met uh, this organization and, and you can understand, well, well we, we have a, a similar organization there. And uh, again, it just builds this bridge a little bit. So the, the su suggestions, how best to engage. And I say PRRC, critically research, rehearse, conduct. Do your research on the interlo interlocutor. What is his or her rank and their background, previous service, service and their interest? And that also makes some, uh, is helpful. Um, I say, do the stakeholder mapping. Um, I only learned about the stakeholder mapping after I'd done it, most of my negotiation, and I could see what I was trying to do, but clearly not doing it terribly well. Who are the real influences? And remember Rog, the military assistant. He was so important to me, and if someone had treated them badly in my outer office, I would have heard about it. I would have heard about it. Similarly, what I very unfairly called the little people, the driver, uh, the, uh, the, the military assistant, the clerk, treat them well because it will always find its way back to the, the, the general. And work out what really matters to him or her. And we talked about the, the, the health of the soldiers and particularly those who had lost limbs. I'd say take small punts. Uh, I don't use the word risk, but I think take, take a gift. Uh, something that you can just pass across and he's, he's suddenly realized that you have given him something. We built a small bridge. And I say rehearse, rehearse like fury, include your interpreter um, because it can all fall away if the first time you start engaging is when, uh, um, with an interpreter is when you are in the room. Your interpreter will, will help you a lot um, in, in most cases. And this is really, really important. And at the CCHM, we've got a group where we discuss some uh, use of the interpreter and try and improve our, our ability. So there it is. Those are my suggestions. I told you I'd end on a high. Um, I just mentioned that, that um, <laughs> this photo uh, clearly indicates that we're lost. But this one is a negotiation in uh, South Sudan with a non-state armed group. And we took along the paramount chief of the tribe whom, with whom we were engaging. And five minutes after this, we were surrounded by some very uh, aggressive looking fighters. And it looked as if it was going to be going badly wrong until they saw the paramount chief, at which point weapons were, were put down and it was all big smiles. And the reason I say rehearse is that, 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 that uh, this is a, a, a military occupation, a military to rehearse their operations and it pays. Therefore, I do urge you to do the same. So in summary, I've, I've put the list here. There is a deeply rooted difference in cultures, in my view, but it's on a firm belief in what humanitarians and militaries do. Don't assume that militaries understand you. Choose the negotiation team wisely. Don't be intimidated by rank or bling, but try to understand those ranks. Security is, is a big concern. Uh, anticipate it. And to identify the counterparts, needs or interests, consider all relationships where possible. Please do use the tools that, that, that you're taught, taught here at the CCHM um, and be professional in your timings, appearance and preparation. And uh, every time I walk into the CCHM, people laugh about my shoes because I spend a lot of time polishing my shoes, um, which I think is important, but not everyone does. And finally, this is ending on a high. Um, this year I did four tours in Northern Ireland and at no stage did I ever believe that um, the troubles were going to end. This photo taken not so long ago, clearly um, Her Majesty is, has now passed away. Equally, the person who she's shaking hands with. Uh, Martin McGuinness, who was a senior, senior commander in the Irish Republican Army, was our principal enemy, if you like. Um, and my point is that no matter how, how hard you, you think things are, and you don't think that things are going to turn out well, sometimes they do. And I just underpin that military operations and negotiations 
are not mutually exclusive. So they can go hand in hand with a positive result. Okay, thank you very much. I think we will wrap it up here. Thank you so much, Stephen, for this very, very informative session. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. We have between 55 to 60 colleagues joining us and tuning in today, which is great. Um, Stephen has referred a lot to CCHN workshops, simulations, tools. For those of you who are not yet community members of the CCHN, we invite you to join a CCHN peer workshop where you'll be introduced to the CCHN methodology. Um, tools and then also join our community of practice, which is currently about 6,000 people strong, where you can really also learn from your peers on different topics. If this session was interesting for you, um, we will be having more speakers on a bi weekly basis. We will dive deeper also into negotiations with non state armed groups with Rick Rubin, who is a colleague of Stephen at the ICRC, and we're also hoping to get representatives of non-state armed groups in this session who can actually present to you their view. We will be having a session also with the director of a private military company because we know this is also a concern for many of you. How do we negotiate with private military companies? And we are having officers of also different armed forces in the Middle East and in Asia who will present to you their view um, on how they perceive humanitarians in a negotiation and also how they are trained on negotiation themselves, which will hopefully help all of us to understand that better. In parallel, we're starting uh, another speaker series that is on assertive or adversarial counterparts, where we very much look at how do we negotiate also with very strong states or civilian authorities. That will start off more on the soft skill side. How do we handle a very adversarial negotiation? We will be starting that with uh, Kirk Pinnell, um, who has a lot of experience in hostage negotiation, and we will kickstart this speaker series in the end of October. So stay tuned on CCHN Connect, on LinkedIn, on our website to hear what is coming up. It has been a great pleasure to be with you here today. Thank you very much for joining, and we look forward to seeing you soon again. And thank you very much, Steve. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve.